summary of the spirit catches you and you fall down by and fatiman. In the literary non-fiction work titled The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, the author covers the life of a little girl named Lia Li and health problems. In the 1980s, Lia is a young Hmong person living in Merced, California. The Hmong are a group of immigrants and refugees who used to live in the mountains of Laos. Lia, who has seizures, has a hard time with the American medical system. This play makes Fatiman think about what American medicine is like and gives a full ethnographic study of Hmong society. Even though the story is mostly about the Lee family, Fatiman talks to a lot of Hmong people and experts to get a full picture of this rich and complicated society. While it would be too much to go into detail here about all the history and other stories she brings to light, it is important to know that Fatiman's project is driven by both Lia Li's story and an interest in the complicated ways that Hmong and American cultures interact. Lia is the only one of Fua Li's 13 children who was born in a hospital. Fua gave birth to the others while sitting on the dirt floor of her and now cow's home in Laos. Many of them died when they were very young. Lia has a seizure when she is three months old after her bigger sister Yer loudly slams a door. She was born healthy. Leah's parents think that this noise scared her and caused her soul to leave her body. According to Fatiman, this is a common idea in Hmong culture. It's called quag dab peg, which means the spirit catches you and you fall down. A dab is an evil spirit, and the Hmong believe there are many of them ready to hurt people by stealing their souls. The Hmong have a complicated view of quag dab peg. The illness involves evil spirits and soul loss, but it also often means that a person is physically able to become a shamanistic healer, since healers, also called siv nebs, have seizures to talk to evil spirits and bargain and fight to get back the victim's soul. In the Hmong community, siv nebs are very respected. Leah's parents, the Lees, are very protective and loving, so they are sad about the loss of her soul but happy that she might one day become a healer. This mixed confidence is very different from what the staff at MCMC, Merced's Neighborhood Hospital, thinks. Lia has 20 more seizures in just a few months after her first one. Asian people are not sure if Western medicine works or is reliable, but the Lees are scared enough to take Lia to MCMC twice during this time in the hopes of getting her some medicine that will fix her body and keep her state stable. Unfortunately, Leah stops having seizures before they get to the hospital both times, and they can't tell the doctors why they're there because now Kao and Fua don't speak English. Leah finally comes back on her third visit, but she is still seizing. They also meet a doctor named Dan Murphy who is interested in Hmong culture. This doesn't happen very often. Most of the doctors at MCMC get frustrated with the large number of Hmong patients who refuse to get good care. Dan tells Leah that he needs to put an four in her head to give her a dose of Valium that will keep her from seizing. His nephew helps him explain everything in Hmong. Now Kao and Fua don't want to do it at first, but Dan finally gets them to agree, and he is able to keep Leah stable. Dan told her she had epilepsy, but he had no idea that the Lees had already told them their daughter had the emotionally charged quag dab peg. He keeps her in the hospital for a few days so he can keep an eye on her condition. Then he sends her home and tells Nao Kao and Fua to give her a certain set of medicines that they can't understand or follow. It has already been said that Hmong people are not very sure about Western health. Hmong people sometimes think that hospitals and some drugs can make people sicker than they were before. This is not a mean-spirited point of view, it comes directly from their spiritual practices and deeply held beliefs. For instance, the Hmong think that when people are asleep, their souls are at large, which means that any kind of anesthesia lets dabs, bad spirits, hurt them. Even though now Kao and Fua are worried, they still take Lia to MCMC when she has big seizures, which happen a lot. In fact, she goes to the emergency room over 100 times and is brought to MCMC 17 times between the ages of 8 months and 4 and a half years. Neil Ernst and Peggy Philp are the head doctors at MCMC during this time. They are very smart, curious, quick to admit when they're wrong in order to solve problems, and, strangely enough, married to each other. Neil and Peggy do everything they can to get Leah better. 
They try to fully explain to Nao Kao and Fua how to give Liao the medicines they recommend. But since the seizures keep happening, it's clear that the Lees aren't taking their medicine as prescribed. In the beginning, the doctors think this is because they don't understand. The Lees don't even speak or read English, let alone their own language. Because of this, Lia has trouble following the complicated mix of different medicines, which means she keeps having seizures that threaten her brain development. To fix this, MCMC gets the Merced County Health Department to start bringing public health workers to the Lee home to keep an eye on Leah's medication usage. Not a single one of these nurses is able to reach Nao Kao and Fua, though. They do what they're told but don't follow through when they're left to their own ways. Reading these nurses' notes makes it clear to Peggy Filth that the Lees are not following their treatment plan because they don't fully understand how important each medicine is and because they don't trust the drugs themselves. Now Kao and Fua, on the other hand, think that their daughter is getting too much medicine because she is sometimes hyperactive, upset, or slow and shaky. They have seen the many side effects of each drug. Their doctors have a hard time with this idea because, as doctors, they're used to patients who follow orders and fully believe in the power of medicine and science in general. But Fua tells Dan Murphy one night in the hospital that she doesn't think anyone should have to take drugs for the rest of their lives. So it shouldn't be a surprise that Leah won't get any medicine from the Lees for three months. When Dan sees Leah again, she is being rushed to the hospital because she is having a great mal seizure. The doctors and the Lees are still fighting with each other. Fua and Nao Kao's refusal to give Leah all the medicine she needs is making Neil Ernst more and more angry. He thinks that this is hurting her brain. Eventually, a nurse comes to the Lee's house and finds that they are not only not giving all of the right medicines, but they are also giving twice as much of one drug than the doctor told them to. Neil Ernst writes to Child Protective Services CPS, to ask them to put Leah in foster care because of poor parental compliance. He says, this case obviously would come under the realm of child abuse, specifically neglect. Then he tells CPS that if the Lees keep caring for their daughter in this way, Leah could get irreversible brain damage and possibly even die. Soon after Neil writes this note, Leah is sent to live with a foster family for two weeks. She will return home after that to give Nao Kao and Fua one last chance to give the medicines correctly. Despite this, Lia is taken away again because blood tests show she is not taking the right amount of medicine. This time, she will be with her parents for at least six months while they show they can take care of her. Lia is given to Dee and Tom Corda, who are kind and loving parents. They become friends with Fua and now Kao and encourage them to visit. Eventually, they even publicly ask the government to give them back custody of their daughter. At six months, now Kao and Fua are found not to be able to care for Lia because they didn't sign a certain paper and because they didn't give Lia her medicine during a one-week trial period when they were allowed to take her home, which led to her being hospitalized again. As this time goes on, a very hard-working social worker named Janine Hilt teaches the Lees how to properly give their daughter's medicines, working closely with Fua to make sure she knows how much to give the child. Lia eventually moves back in with her family with the help of Janine. After some peace and quiet, Lia hits her head on a swing and goes into status epilepticus, a state that can damage the brain permanently. Even though doctors are able to stable her, she gets a rare infection in her airway, which is where the breathing tube is put. She has to stay in the hospital for two weeks because of this. Now Kao remembers, the doctors kept Lia in the hospital for so long, and it made her getting worse and worse. After three weeks, she has another very bad seizure, which forces her doctors to rethink her medicines, which the Lees have been faithfully providing. Neil starts to worry that Leah is going to have a big seizure that he won't be able to stop. This fear comes true the night before Thanksgiving in 1986, Leah is brought to MCMC, and they can't stop her from seizing for a long time. They are finally able to calm her, but she has been in status epilepticus for almost two hours. Being in this state for even 20 minutes is thought to be life-threatening. Neil is traumatized by what happened and worries about Leah's health, so he has her moved to Valley Children's Hospital in Fresno, which is better able to handle her case. 
Leah gets to Fresno, however, while she is having yet another very bad grand mal seizure. Her lips and nail beds are blue, and her arms and legs are shaking violently. Dr. Kopaz treats her for 12 hours straight that night and says she is in profound shock, probably of septic origin. It is called bacterial invasion of the circulatory system. Additionally, Leah's brain has pretty much stopped working. The doctors at Valley Children's Hospital are sure she is about to die, no matter how hard they try. Fua is horrified as she sees a doctor walk into the room and separate her daughter from the four lines. The doctor thinks that the Lees have decided to turn off Leah's life support. The Lee family is sure that the doctors at Valley Children's Hospital hurt their daughter by giving her too much medicine, so they want her to be moved back to Merced to die with her family there. Leah can't go home right away, but Janine Hilt makes plans with Valley Children's Hospital to bring the girl, who is now totally unconscious, to MCMC. She stays there for four days before finally going home to die. When she gets there, her parents start making natural mung medicines by boiling plants and using the mixture to wash her body. Her American doctors are shocked when she doesn't die. Since Leah has been unconscious for two years, Fatiman meets the Lees after they have arrived. In other words, her doctors have been waiting for her to die for two years and are shocked that she's still alive. Even though she is completely paralyzed, her parents take very good care of her. They often hold Siv Neebs and Hmong animal sacrifices to bring her soul back to her body. In a chat with Dr. Hutchinson, who was in charge of Leah's care at Valley Children's Hospital, Fatiman says that the Lees think the drugs Leah took caused her brain damage. One of the drugs she was on, Depakin, may have weakened her immune system and made her more likely to get bacterial illnesses, so Hutchinson agrees that this opinion may not be too far from the truth. After Fatiman has looked at him in a confused way, he tells him, go back to Merced. And tell all those people at MCMC that the family did not do this to the kid, we did. About the author. And Fatiman is the daughter of Clifton Fatiman, a well-known author, editor, radio host, and TV figure, and Annalie Jacoby Fatiman, a screenwriter and war reporter. She went to Harvard University and was the first editor of Civilization, a journal of the Library of Congress. She has also edited the well-known journal The American Scholar and written two collections of essays and a book about her father. She is married to the author George Howe Colt and has two children with him. She teaches nonfiction at Yale University. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.